Hello my lovelies, it's Taylor's Once Upon a Beauty here. I hope you're all having a wonderful day today. So in today's video is I'm going to be reviewing these two nice coffee table makeup books by Amazon. And they might be a bit pricey on Amazon, but they're worth the price because they're just really nice how each one of them, including this one, has a lot of different facts and details about makeup and how it started and like when does it start and has it catch on including these very beautiful makeup ads and all the facts and details of other trends in the like from each decade to the 21st century and the 20th century so in this one right here face paint the his the story of makeup by lisa eldridge this one is like the same thing, except it's a little bit different. She uh, tells how when makeup starts and, you know, how she got interested in makeup. And she's always been fascinated with the colors and the story behind makeup, including all the celebrities with their trends of when they started makeup. All right, so the first one I'm going to be reviewing is this one, Face Paint, The Story of Makeup. And I'm going to be reviewing to see how good this book is. Oh, it's so beautiful. Look at the vintage makeup in the beginning of this. So I might skip ahead a few pages because, you know, I want to make the video too long. So I'll start with the introduction right here. From what Lisa Eldridge was telling us in this book is, although we have been painting ourselves in a variety of ways for thousands of years, the reasons why and how we wear makeup in the 21st century have changed dramatically now when we put on our makeup. We literally hundreds of trends and styles to choose from. There's a full spectrum of color and multitude of affordable and not so affordable products in our fingertips. With the freedom to use these products as we want without censure, something that was not the case until fairly recent times, but to really understand how painting our face was involved into fine art, we need to know and we need to look back and track our ever-evolving relationship with makeup. Tracing the journey has led to beauty becoming to the multi-billion dollar industry it is today. I have been fascinated by makeup since I was a child, initially captivated more by the color. When I was 13, I decided I wanted to be a makeup artist after the family friend gave me a book about theatrical makeup for my birthday. And ever since then, face paint from the past, present, and future has been my life. I started collecting vintage items like powder boxes, and antique pots of blush in the early 1990s, and I'll never forget the rush of excitement and discovering my first vintage makeup, finding at its at stall in the Portobello Road Market in London. So yeah, this is what Lisa Eldridge was telling us of you know, how she started makeup and how fascinated she is with it. I think she did a really good job of writing this beautiful book, including all these gorgeous photos of all the old historical facts and details about like when makeup started in this. So I'm going to be showing you like some of the like celebrities in the past like Audrey Hepburn, Bridget Bardot, Amy Winehouse, Marilyn Monroe, Liz Taylor. Facts about you know what the trend they used and what kind of stuff they used for their face. And Thea Barra, she uh, started her coal liner from years back in the 1930s. The 1920s. 
So here she is, the beautiful Theta Bera was a vamp looking silent film star in the 1920s through 30s. <clears throat> One of America's first movie stars, Theta Bera, was unique that she was completely invented by the studio publicity department. She was an intriguing phenomenon whose films return more money per dollar in investment than any of those actresses at her time. Her real name is Theodosa Goodman. Goodman. Sorry, I can't talk right today. So, I'm going to start where she is start her makeup trends in her time. Vamps and flappers, both with their hair and makeup style signifying their type of audience is, is especially pre-talkies. Barra's face was a tom of the vampishness, intense and sensual with heavy, lidded, coal-rimmed eyes. She soon became famous everywhere, as film departments were just coming the grips with their demands of the early black and white uh, Oromanic film. I think that's how it's pronounced. She was oversensitive to the blue, thus made Vera's eyes look pale. It's reported that Helen, Helena Rubinstein for, formulate the special intense coal to make her eyes appear expressive on film. So yeah, this is how she started her, uh, her famous coal trimmed eyeliner around her eyes, including... Her black shadow and her vampy looking appearance right here. She just looks so beautiful. She's one of my favorite silent film stars and Mary Pickford. Oh, and here we have Claire Bow, the it girl back in the 1930s. Let's see. So, like many other stars in the silent film era, Clara Bow rose to fame from less than auspicious beginnings. Born in 1905 in Brooklyn, she was part of the first generation to grow up in silent films. She wanted to be a movie star despite the disapproval of her mentally ill mother who attempted to slit Bow, Bow's throat with her butcher knife. Rather than have her daughter to do something as disgraceful as acting, she got her break when she won Star Spotting Contest in the Fans Magazine. Alright, so let me uh, start it when she got her makeup appearance with her makeup trends. Bo's appearance was become crucial to her success, on, although her feisty tomboy image, which made her equally appealing to both men and women, was true with her personality, many aspects of her look right here, such as her thin, low, downward pointing eyebrows and her small rosebud lips with the exaggerated Cupid's bow, and her large, cold eyes came to atomize the quintessential new women. Yeah, Bo was also famous for her distinctive red hair, a film that was created for her hair was bleach and hate it to make her hair even redder. She did a film called Red Hair, which was based on by her right here. And so the beauty products for makeup she appeared was Max Factor Society makeup ads to powder and perfume right here. So yeah, she was uh, one of the most famous silent film stars in uh, the 1930s and 20s era. Oh, Josephine Baker, so beautiful in her time. I mean, look how classy she looked, especially with her unique shiny hair. Civil rights campaigner, dancer, singer, and actress Josephine Baker embodied like Jazz Age, like no one else. Born in 1906 in St. Louis, Missouri, 
She began working at an early age, waitressing and clearing to help support her family and herself as she ran away. So, I'm going to start how she did her makeup trends, like I do in the other two pages, the other stars. Alright, so her dark skin was celebrated in Paris in a way it had never been back home in a high-profile beauty campaigns and endorsements followed. She appeared at billboards across Paris advertising a glossy hair pomade like Baker's Fix and Helena Rubenstein. Never one to miss an opportunity. Promised her in that Valet's Water Lily body cream that would give you like a body like Josephine Baker. <laughs> Baker was no stranger to cosmetics or a good cons costume. Traveling with 137 pounds of face powder on her 1920 tour, 1929 tour in Europe and South Africa. So, yeah, she, uh, she used a lot of face powder in her face. You know, she likes to be all glammed up with her shows. And especially dressing up in her costumes to, you know, get her act going in her shows. So, she lived in France and dedicated her life to human rights. She had to play an important role in the French Renaissance Ren Renaissance during World Second World War, acting as an undercover operative as an Official mark of respect for all she's done for adopted country. She was the first American woman to be buried in France with military honors. Yeah, she is a good woman. Her, uh, her shows and you know, everything she did back then. She was portrayed by um, Lynn Whitfield in a movie. Anime Wong, right here. The first Chinese movie star in Hollywood, right here. Anime Wong was born in LA on the outskirts of Chinatown. She was fascinated by the movies that would film there. Many studios at the time used it as a substitute for China. She got her first break when she asked to be an extra of one film, such as The Age of 14. She continued playing parts over the next couple of years before leaving school to pursue the acting full-time in 1921. With her trademark blunt bangs and typically sleek 20 hair and undoubtedly her most exotic heritage, despite the fact that she was American, Anna Mae Wong was a vamp. Anti-miscontagion laws in the United States at this time prohibit interracial relationships with men she could not play leading lady unless the leading man was also Asian. Even the lead character was intended to be Asian. She would inevitably go to a Caucasian actress in Oriental makeup. The frustration and discrimination only being offered a certain villainous type of role, which made her eager to go to Europe and the opportunity rep presented itself in 1928. So, Anime Wong's career never took off as it should, but she remains an incredibly porn and ant's trailblazer, and her influence in beauty and world continued as a U.S. fashion designer. Anna Sui, or Sue, used her as an inspiration for her makeup and hair for her eight W 2014 show. Greta Garbo, one of the most iconic women back then in Hollywood. Garbo was born Greta Gustafsson in 1905 in Stockholm, Sweden. She was fascinated by the theater and would reportedly hang around to watch the actors come off and go. After leaving school, she modeled hats in department stores where she worked, led to a full-time modeling career and commercial work. 
She won her scholarship in Royal Traumatic Theater in Stockholm, where she is discovered by the Swedish director Moritz Steller, who became her mentor. They were they both signed to MGM by Louis B. Mayer, who they filmed the saga of Gosta Berling. So yeah, she was um a good makeup muse and a good very good actress in Hollywood. She did most of her iconic film work. Like Camille. I forgot what was that other film she did. It was um You know what? Never mind. I'm just going to stick to what kind of makeup she used. Silverstone number two, which was popular among movie actors because it had a touch of silver in it, creating a shimmery look. When it was not filming, she reported to have worn just a dash of powder and a little lipstick and an eyebrow pencil, along with her accent and voice. Garbo style represented a sophisticated foreign ideal of femininity. It was such a huge influence on the look of 1930s Vanity Fair. Showed how Garbo's look was affecting her peers as well as audience with the featured titled the Then Came Garbo. Unlike some stylized looks that have been so popular in the 1920s, Greta Garbo's cool, polished beauty has been maintained its appeal. 1959 years as she made her last movie, it effectively disappeared from the public life. Garbo was voted the most beautiful woman in the world. The, the, Guin, you know, the Guinness Book of World Records, it... There is no denying that her face is hypnotic. Writer and philosopher Roland Barthless summed it up when she wrote that Garbo still belongs to that moment in cinema when capturing the human face still plunge audiences into the deepest ecstasy. When no one literally least no, literally lost one itself in the human image. Sorry, the light's in the way. Alright, so I'm going to shorten it up by, you know, showing you more icons of how they got their makeup trend started. I'm going to show you my favorite ones. Showing you all these pages and makeup ads of old Hollywood glamour. This is a very nice coffee table book. I hope if any of you love this book so much, it, like I do, you can go on, <clears throat> go on and buy it on Amazon. Like I said far it might be a bit pricey, but you know, it's still worth it if any of you want to get it to know all about facts about makeup like I do. Alright, so one of my favorite models in the 60s was Twiggy. Twiggy, if anyone was cinemas with the college-ish wide eye that swept in the fashion world, it was Twiggy. Born as Leslie Hornby in Neesden, Northwest London in 1949, she dreamed becoming a model even though she was teased being too thin. She once said, James Shrimpton was my female idol. I had her all over my walls. Photographer Barry Litzigan took the famous headshots that kick-started her career after she had her hair colored and cropped short by chic celebrity hairdresser Leonard or Leonard. There weren't 
any fashion makeup artists at the time, so models would do their own faces shoots. Twiggy must have been pretty accomplished makeup artist, as you can see from those first shots. The eyeliner was perfectly drawn and she had developed her own style. Her makeup was eventually a mod look with heavy dark and skin tone mouth using concealer or pan stick to blank out her lips was unusual. As lipsticks on the market at the time were developed enough usually gave that look. The in screen I in in create sorry <laughs> who comes up with these words the in you know I forget it. The eye makeup was the focal point at itself filled with white and pale colored eyeshadow with black line along the upper lashes and other graphic tracing the area just above the socket line very round shape like many others made mid uh, to the late 60s she was inspired by the look of 30 screen sirens so yeah she got all of her inspirations Pretty much was from the 1930s, and that's how she started her own trend, was doing her own makeup of her mod 1960s look right here with the nice-looking false lashes and eyeliner. She's a, yeah, she's very good. Very talented model and makeup artist. Still loves up today. Elizabeth Taylor... The beautiful, gorgeous Queen of Hollywood right here. She was well known for most beauty, famous, let, lash, let eyes, and eight marriages. Mostly her marriages and her affair with her jewelry. So yeah, the philosophy on her beauty right here is all natural. She was born with jet black hair. Thick eyebrows, beautiful violet eyes, and double lashes, which was a genetic disease of double lashes. So, you know, it's a blessing and a curse for her. Arguably well known for her beauty, famous violet eyes and eight marriages, which one of them were. Actor Richard Burton, mostly him because she mostly did love him of all of her other eight marriages. Taylor was born in London in 1932. Her parents were both Americans, so Taylor had dual citizenship before the outbreak of the Second World War. The Taylor family moved back to the United States and settling in Los Angeles, California. One of her most iconic roles... I mean, was Cleopatra, mostly because she did her own eye makeup of her famous coal liner and green eyeshadow and red lips. She was a child star. One of her, you know, movies she did was a child was, was Lassie movies and also National Velvet. This is a very beautiful, very beautiful pictures in all these. You can get all kinds of inspirations and ideas from these two books. Madonna, the ultimate makeup chameleon. She had a lot of looks over the years with her beauty trends and her, you know, with whatever she wants to look. She changes and changes to many different looks as she wants or cans till it, you know. Okay, so. The best selling female recording artist of all time, which was Madonna right here, is a chameleon and master of renov 
reinvention more than any other icon with her ever-changing look and have played a crucial part on her outgoing, ongoing success over the past three decades. As so famously said, I am my own experience, and I quote, I am my own work of art or in the lyrics of Vogue. Beauty is where you find it. Madonna was born as Madonna Louise Sicone in 1958 in the suburb of Detroit. In 76, she left high school for a dance scholarship at the University of Michigan, but dropped out after a couple of years to move to New York City where she modern dance was really happening. Her first single deal in 1982 was Holiday and Borderline and Lucky Star. She brought her fame three years later on playing Mass in Square Garden. Even Madonna's first iconic makeup look when she complimented was a punky style multi bangs and lacy gloves inspired by her 80s downtown. So all of her makeup ideas, you know, she does you know, herself. She goes from look to look to look nonstop, especially with her, her shows, their music, their music videos. She does have some nice, luscious, thick eyebrows her hair always had. And she did a film back in the 80s called Who's That Girl? And she played the lead star. Amy Winehouse, my one of my favorite inspirations and music artists right here. I admired her, her extreme eyeliner right here and her pale lips. She mostly wears pink li lipstick right here. Sometimes I do see her wear red lipstick in some of her videos and sometimes I do see her hair tamed down without her famous beehive look. So, her inspirations of her hairstyle was Bridget Bardo and the Ronettes. That's how she got her beehive hair. In today's celebrities, trends would not hone on and on and stick with one particular look. She was different, and a good different. She went from, they prefer to chop and change it according to mood and trend, talented, Talented British singer and songwriter Amy Winehouse was no exception. However, she had such a strong personal style that next to her distinctive voice, her signature was her voice, her extreme eyeliner, and her B.I. hairdo. Her Winehouse identity was a cultural smash-up. Where, like many other icons in this book, the singer was inspired of what had become before. And there are clear visual references of touchstones such as Cleopatra, Betty Grable, Vargas Vixens, and the 1960 girls group like the Ronettes, in her pinup style clothing, infamous B.I. hair, and exaggerated makeup. One house, unfortunately, did tragically die young at age 27 like all the other rock singers who unfortunately passed away at 27, which was famously or infamously known as called the 27 Club. But her influence continues to be popular culture among her fans, other celebrities. Lady Gaga created an Instagram image of her look. Jean Paul Gaultier paid her... His Respects with the Wine House inspired fashion collection in 2012. O'Reilly said they often have paid just 15 minutes to pull it all together for a retro red lips. Use creamy rimmel lip pencil and lipstick by U <clears throat> Uni in China. Intense retro matte blue red right here that married perfectly in her vintage inspired look. The thick lashes of flicked eyeliner where White has a signature were always on there. She was rarely ever seen without them. That's true, she was rarely seen without them when I watched her videos of interviews and her music videos especially.
Okay, so the last page I'm going to be showing you is one of my most famous and favorite inspirations of all in Hollywood is Audrey Hepburn. Just give me a second to find it. It's in here. Okay, Audrey Hepburn right here. One of my most favorite icons right here that I adore and love as my inspiration. <clears throat> it says, Audrey Kathleen Rustin Hepburn Rustin was born in Brussels, 1929. When she was five, she started in the English boarding school, which when she was first began to study ballet, that was what she originally wanted to do was ballet, you know, but she said in her own words, she plunged into show business because she didn't make it as a ballet dancer. It is a stiff competition when you're on ballet. Her time was cut short of, by the declaration of war. She returned home, unfortunately, Holland wouldn't stay neutral for a long, and Germany evaded in 1940. Hepper and her family eventually liberated on her own 16th birthday in 45. In 51, Hepper was discovered by Colette, the author in the novel of Gigi, who asked her to play the title part in the book's theater adaption in the same year. This would launch Hepburn's career. Soon after, she got the part in Roman Holiday that, apart from Holly Golightly and Breakfast at Tiffany, she would come to define her, from which she won her Oscar the Best Actress. Hepburn's makeup did change quite a bit between the 50s and 60s. The 50s, well, she was known for her beautiful, luscious, thick, you know, big eyebrows right here. She would like overly pencil them right here with an with a makeup you know with a makeup eyeliner or makeup brow thing. And she was also famously known for her beautiful doe eyes. That was as she started the trend was her doe eyes with liquid eyeliner and it became the trend ever since. A lot of people have been nonstop using it ever since for quite a while. So the makeup she wore, she wore was, let's see, her brows were very thick and dramatically penciled in and she mainly wore red lipstick. In the 60s, her eye makeup stayed pretty much the same in her signature doe-eyed style. Her brows were much lighter and she wore a very soft peachy shade, peachy pink shade of lipstick was typical of the time. The most uh, famous shade she wore in Breakfast at Tiffany's, and it, you know she made that, you know, lipstick a big trend was Pink in the Afternoon by Revlon. So I have a tube of it myself, and it is a beautiful pink shade lipstick, and I had to like find it, you know, because you know she started that trend in the 60s in the movie so I decided to buy it because you know I liked it okay so you know this is a beautiful coffee table makeup book you can find all kinds of articles and facts about makeup and especially old Hollywood glamour facts of celebrities you know pioneering their own makeup trend and if you like this book, you can go ahead and buy it on Amazon if you want. Definitely would recommend this kind of book to read. Okay, so this is the part one I'm going to be doing on this video of this book right here. So I'm going to be doing a part two about this one right here. About Gabriela Hernandez, Classic Beauty, The History of Makeup. If you all love this video, give me a thumbs up and subscribe down to my channel below. Bye!